Hello. Welcome everyone to uh, another session of the uh, Binala Talk series, which is a lecture series that we have uh, here at the School of Archaeology every Wednesday, usually, um, where we invite speakers from various different backgrounds, various different disciplines, to come about their, uh, to talk about their research interests, to talk about uh, whatever you know interests them, so that um, we could all share in a wonderful discussion and be more um, enriched by it. So today, uh, we have our very own Dr. Victor Paz here speaking on a very interesting topic that I think most of us can appreciate and really think about, considering that it's about Jose Rizal. Uh, but uh, before we begin, we do have just a couple of announcements. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we are the Binala Talk series is now officially funded by the uh, OVCRD Extension Grant. Yay! Uh, <laughs> 10,000 10, pesos. Very much. <laughs> As you can see, we have some very new high-tech equipment over the past few weeks. So uh, we can really up the quality, not only for in-person uh, binalats, but also the recordings online, which you can all find at the uh, School of Archaeology uh, YouTube page, <coughs> where we have a, a very nice backlog of uh, different binalat talks. So feel free to take a look at that if you're interested in any of the topics that we previously presented as there's a chance that uh, the recording will, will be posted there uh, if we have recorded that. Uh, secondly, I'd like to announce that later at 2 p.m. we have the uh, thesis proposal of one uh, Ruben, or Kim, as most of us know him, uh, where he'll be uh, presenting his thesis topic. Uh, and please come and support uh, a very important member of our community. Uh, I think that might be the final announcements. So, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for today. So, most of us know him, uh, Dr. Victor Paz. <laughs> he is um, currently a uh, faculty member here at the School of Archaeology. He was previously the dean, uh, the, the director, thank you, of uh, formerly uh, the Archaeological Studies Program. Uh, and yeah, he's been teaching here many years. Uh, he's seen countless students and helped students graduate. So, uh, without further ado, Dr. Victor Paz. Thank you. Oh yeah, I don't need this, no? Uh, Jane, can you hear me? Good? Claro, yeah. Oh, thank you for coming. I knew it. Just put the name of Jose Rizal, people will come to listen. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this Binalot is uh, partly uh, inspired as a reaction to Vigestrelles Binalot back in, when was this, 2021, uh, right? When uh, Vic, for those who know Vic, who have been with Vic in excavations, uh, Vic specializes in an analyzing gold artifacts. And so when he found out that Rizal found, according to Austin Craig, found a gold ring that led him to go and look into the documents, the literature, and then was fascinated about Rizal. So independently, he came to the conclusion that Rizal was uh, a practicing archaeology or, or an archaeologist. Now, I say independently because back around 2013, I gradually accepted also that Rizal must have been the first Filipino or Indio archaeologist. Gradually, because the man doesn't need more titles, as you know. No? And then in those days, I remember when Solheim died and Leo Cuerdo made the vase of Solheim, which is now in the library. We asked, uh, Leo, can you make a statue of Rizal where Rizal is disheveled, right? Disheveled hair, no? rolled sleeves, and then uh, holding something, no? like uh, fingers like this, so you can put a a shirt or anything, right? And then in Baybayin, uh, Jose Rizal, first archaeologist, you know, Filipino archaeologist. So that project was going on, it be funny, but as uh, uh, Deo's life when became uh, very complicated, it's not finished. Maybe one day in the future that will end. That will be part of our art collection. But the point here is, uh, Vic Estrella also commented in a paper that I wrote uh, some time back that, well, Rizal is not an accidental archaeologist. 
uh, Rizal is a, uh, a scientific archaeologist, uh, and he's not wrong. So today, I have to explain exactly what I mean by accidental, which is not uh, mutually ex uh, exclusive, to, or it is not different from, it can be accidental and scientific, but that's not the point I'm raising here. The point I'm raising here is that the, the way I use the word accidental has two levels of meaning. One, within the larger context of my periodization in this work that I'm uh, working on forever on like a, a philosophical history of archaeology in the Philippines. And the second one is that truly Rizal was not still the archaeologist of the contemporary kind. So he was still short of it, and therefore accidental. And today, there's also a finer, finer tuning of facts that I would like to share that will underscore this point. So in this periodization that of, of Philippine archaeology, the praxis of it, uh, this is the relevant period, the accidental period which is a big chunk of from 18, mid 19th century to the 1920s. And the internal logic of this periodization really is this transforming uh, appreciation of uh, cultural materiality of, of cultures, for cultural materiality from the past, I mean, and the transformation of the disciplines, theory and practice. So tracking that down, that made me periodize Philippine archaeology, its practice in this manner. But I did not end there. So for to change from one period to the other, you need several variables. And now no period, unless it's really classically different, such as pre-archaeology and reflective archaeology, and there's a lot of periods in between, it is a short, it, it is a not a drastic transformation as some, as it will come out in many of the narratives, it is a, a very subtle transformation. But then, once more of the variables have changed, then you move to the next period. So there has to be many, many changes in many of the variables. Uh, namely, a change in paradigm that only happened once, right, in the late 90s. Then we are still in the same materialist paradigm in the moment. Adding value, how do cultures add value to, to artifacts, you know, to, to objects from the past? That also changes through time. Reflectiveness, is there a community that reflects? People are practicing none, and then more and more and more until now. Uh, how do we in, in, generate our information? So the generation information, again, that transforms slowly through time. What is the state support? Colonial state, national state, no? From none to heavily supported as now, right? And um, what is the support of the private sector? And what is the sociological relationship of the practitioners of archaeology with a larger community? Again, that is a slow transformation. And then the expression of an archaeological conscience. Are we aware that we are archaeologists? And here, again, we go back to Rizal, we will know that he was not aware that he was an archaeologist, even though he knew the literature, he knew that archaeology was happening. So we have to ask, uh, Grace. <laughs> so my argument is this, Rizal, like, like the illustrados of his time, the educated elite, were very well honed. They, they had a very good sense of their historiography by the late 19th century. So Rizal was sort of unique that way, no? Paterno has his own version. Isabella de Estrellas, of course, will, uh, will run with it. It has his own version. Zulueta no? was the one of the first ones who said, oh, no, no, we have to write a, a history from our perspective not a appendix of Spanish history in the Philippines. He was already saying that, but he died at the age of 24, so his career as a historian ended quickly. But here's a good quote from Encarnacion Alzona, one of the pioneer early female historians 
uh, pensionado. Here, she said, Risala, the idea that the educational system must teach history, not uh, independent of universal or Spanish history in the curriculum of the school system. So that is a very clear articulation of what Rizal wants and what he thinks is relevant, important. Like I said, not unique. That is how all of them were thinking, the, the more advanced of these illustrados. But then, more importantly, uh, Rizal was very close to the apex or the center of scientific discourse in Germany. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a member of the uh, German Anthropological Ethnological Society, or the Berlin. Uh, Wirchum himself uh, inducted him uh, into the association. He had close uh, correspondence with Bastian, who was a polymath, who, who came to the Philippines, uh, and was a co-founder of the association. And, and was corresponding with him, I think, even when he was in the Pitan. So he was really there. And he had this engagement, a scientific engagement with them. And he knew about archaeology as they knew about archaeology and paleontology, especially virtual. So when Rizal went back to Europe in 1890, and then he, he annotated Morga, published it, he started to organize the uh, what you call the, like a Philippine Studies Association, right? So, and then he, was, and he wanted uh, Blumentree to be the president of it, and he said that what we need is a conference. And why don't we make a conference in, in the next uh, Paris uh, exposition? And so, so we do that, right? So he was writing, so he wrote, he wrote Blumentree in German, he wrote the bylaws of the association in uh, French, Right? And then he organized the outline of the conference. Right? So he did all of that. So, so he was all set for it. Uh, unfortunately, the French government didn't allow them uh, at the end. But the important part here is, in the outline of the conference, it, it will tell you again the result sense of what is important, what has to be addressed in terms of gathering all these Philippine, Philippines. You know? specialists from all over the world, including him, and then and, and discussing what they know. So it's, there's a session on the Philippines before the arrival of, of the Spaniards, a session from the arrival of the Spaniards to the loss of the Philippine autonomy, uh, incorporation of the Philippine Spanish nation up to the Cavite mutiny of 1872, and linguistics. <laughs> then you have linguistics. <laughs> For, for obvious reasons, he was very much interested in languages, in linguistics, etc. But in all of these sessions, in all of these sessions, there was no mention of archaeology. The closest mention would be uh, paleography, right? Paleography and early inhabitants, classification, civilization, etc. But what's also important, the association was built. He said one of the one of the goals of association was to build a museum to house Philippine objects. But it seems like all of them, like all of them, meaning all the illustrators of that time, when you talk about material culture, it was always about the material culture, the living cultures. And they did not see too much of a uh, separation from anything that's old. They see that as part of living culture. And then the Chinese porcelain was that part of it. I don't think that was in their consciousness at all. So what we're doing here is we're saying, well, OK, if that's clearly Rizal has a strong sense of history, but is he an archaeologist of any sort? Well, our evidence comes in a roundabout way. Retana did not talk about archaeology even though he had a big chunk of his uh, biography of Rizal in Tapitan, he didn't talk about anything that happened there. And then we get it really via Austin Craig, who interviewed Father Sanchez and mentioned that um, there was a collection in Berlin of artifacts, of archaeological stuff that, that Rizal um, sent to uh, Berlin in his correspondence with his friends in, um, in Europe. 
which up to now I still couldn't find that, that primary uh, um, reference since I've seen it uh, more than a decade ago. And um, so not only did Austin Craig manage to talk to Sanchez, he managed uh, to convince Sanchez to allow him to publish the drawings of Rizal that Father Sanchez was keeping of their, their trip to the hills south of the Pitan. So that ring with the ruby, right? The pendant and the landscape of uh, Liminan and Liminau hills, right? So that's part of the book of Austin Craig. So this is where it starts, but really a very, very deep footnote that people don't underscore that he was going out in the field and then, in a way, being an archaeologist. So that's a close-up of that drawing of Rizal, of, uh, of the ring, of the gold ring, etc., no? and the pendant. Now, but Jose Bantog, who, who is like the scientific marites of that day, of those days, uh, he, he, he was a medical doctor. He was a pensionado. He was the first generation of people who, who studied in the U.S., came back. He, he, was, uh, he was a writer, a popular writer. He went to the Pitan, right, and they wrote books about books and books about Rizal, and he was the founder and first president of the Numismatic and Antiquarian Society of the Philippines. But the following year, he died, no? in 1964. So, but he was a collector, in other words, right? He was also responsible for this idea, or at least giving us a demonstration that Rizal indeed did a bit of archaeology out in the field, right, in, in the Pitan. And so, uh, <laughs> Uh, two publications, side by side, 51 and 61, the, the 10 years apart, but he really, he, it's the same, right? Th those are both Bantog's uh, works, right? writing about Rizal, but an interesting thing here, which adds to the confusion, in the 51 publication, he said he went to Lumanau Hill. In the 61, he corrected it to Limanon here. Now, you think that is not relevant? It's part of the confusion of really what was going on, what really happened out in 1892 in the south of, of the Pitan. And, uh, and this is where something we have an answer you know, that I'll share today, right? But the point here is with Craig and Bantu and the account later on independently of Carl Guthe, who Hearing maybe from Bantuk himself, right, and Craig, uh, and here, that means multiple times, uh, multiple sites uh, investigated. Carl Gute went to Dapitan, right, and followed the footsteps. And and in the in the manuscript, uh, if Jun Kairon had any contribution to to the to ASP, at least he photocopied the manuscripts of Carl Gute and gave it to the library. Here is a fantastic. A diary account of Carl of, of, of Gute saying that the bottom of the trouble was Dr. Rizal, right? Why why he went to the Pitan? Uh, so so I wish that he had either not made himself sufficiently prominent, right? That he doesn't have to investigate the Pitan. So he had to go to the Pitan because people kept telling, go to the Pitan, Rizal excavated there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So 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 that's a uh, and that's one account. And then when he got to the Pitan for three days, it's a fantastic account it's just stating that everyone had an idea of where the cave was. There was a cave, oh yes, oh, everyone knows. Oh yes, then, but no one really knew. <laughs> no, so he was so, he was so annoyed, right? He went around, around, he couldn't find it, no? So this is a, like a funny, sarcastic account of, of all his experience, right? Uh, then, uh, well, I don't know if you can read it, but anyway, but then the most fantastic line I like is, the cave itself caused the greatest amount of speculation on my part. It is the most remarkable cave, for it can change its form and condition according to the, <laughs> the wishes of each individual who has seen it. <laughs> so, it's a big cave, it's a small cave, it's a shallow cave, it's a... <laughs> So each, each account, and so he was so frustrated, right? 
at the end, he went back for three, for three weeks, uh, re-excavated the area where, accordingly, that's where the investigation was in 1892, but never found a cave. No, never found a cave, right? So, now, the real, the bottom of all this, and then, and it was the, of course, it made me say, of course, no? is Father Pastel. Father Pastel, uh, when Lisa was a little boy in Ateneo, he was teaching there, right? But by the time he was an exile, just before exile, he was the father superior of the Jesuits in the Philippines. And he had a long correspondence with Rizal on theology. It was a debate, right? And recently, in 2019, Ateneo published this. They found the letters, no? Uh, this is a very important book for those who are specializing. So these are the correspondence between Pastel and Rizal. Now, Pastel found Rizal a very clever man. And was really, he, his objective was to bring him back to the fold of the church. So the objective was, and in fact, there are speculations that Rizal was exiled in the Pitan precisely because the Pitan is the, uh, controlled by the Jesuits. And in the Pitan, he was convinced that they can convince Rizal to retract and, and, and be religious again. But by all accounts, except for the one, one uh, uh, dubious uh, document, Rizal never retracted, and in fact, in his debates with the Jesuits, he was always uh, very clear that he cannot be a Roman Catholic anymore. But what Pastel did was he recruited this man, Father Sanchez, who was the rhetoric and poetry mentor of Rizal, and, uh, and really a mentor, 12 years older than him. And at this time, he was teaching at Ateneo, Pastel said, oh, no, no, you go to the Pitan and talk to Rizal. So he was sent to the Pitan to team up with the parish priest, Father Obak, who their accounts didn't like Rizal at all, right? So they're mixed. Behind. The Jesuits are friends of Rizal, or are they not really friends? They are just friendly to Rizal because they want him to be back to the fold of the church. Now, this is a question, a nice side, side question. But Sanchez, to, uh, there's a very good uh, article on his biography by Column. Sanchez was already an established naturalist. Once the director of the, Philippine, of the Manila Observatory, he was the curator of the Ateneo Museum. He started the fossil collection of the Ateneo Museum. And after all of this, at this time, he was starting his fieldwork in Siargao. So he, had a, uh, in the, he was in the west, eastern Mindanao, collecting natural history collections, sending them back to the Ateneo from fossils. He was looking for fossils. He was really into fossils no? more than anything else. But now he had to go to Dapitan because he was ordered by Sispira. And the beautiful thing about these Jesuits, they're very learned. They, and they write reports. See, it's like reports, no? So, and then they publish some of these reports, right? In the cartas, no? They're, they're like local journal. And here is Sanchez's report, right? And this is the most detailed account of the Dapitan excavation. Okay, so he was saying that, uh, so the translation of that, Thank you to Google, uh, Google Translate. No? Um, it's a, it's a bit of a, so you see, they were, every day, it's about their uh, excavation, the visit to Limanon Hill, not archaeology, visit to Limanon Hill, scientific data, the poisonous tree, they found this big tree, Banao tree, that's very poisonous, really very, very poisonous. So it's, they were fascinated by that, uh, collected shells. And then the document they found, from a, a royal edict document uh, giving the Kabiling family some rights because they were defenders of the faith uh, in the early days of the Pitan's Christian uh, 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 history. Now, a big, a big Australia pointed out that this was, this could be a typo. No? So he wrote uh, the Pitan, February 31, 1892. Okay? Then he said 15, what, of February, etc. right? And then at the end, somewhere down, down, down the, the report, 
uh, these are the main data collected on the, ex on the excursion of last December 15, right? Oh, so what's going on here? So what I uh, managed to uh, uh, conclude really is that Sanchez went on two trips with Father Obak. But the important thing here is that he never, he said here, on the 15th of the present, Father Obak and I visited the hill of Limanon, on which Uray, widow of Don Pedro Cabiling, blah, 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 right? Tradition or tradition. He only mentions Obak. He doesn't mention uh, Carcinero, no? the, a political, the, go, the commandante. And he never mentioned Rizal in the entire letter. Not a single mention of Rizal. So what's going on here? So this letter, if it is written in December, uh, December, the end of the year, which makes sense because it's like an end of report, end of the year report kind of thing, uh, gave it to Pastel, right, of 1892. By that time, this, it is a report of two trips to the area, not one. So two trips. But where is Rizal here? Well, Rizal definitely was not in the first trip. Rizal was on the second trip because by all the accounts of Craig and Bantog and, San, and Craig, assuming he got it from Sanchez, he said that he went with the captain, the, the commandant, right? So it was Rizal, except for Bantog, it was Rizal who initiated the trip. Now, why was not Rizal mentioned? Is it because it's tricky because he's in exile? He should be not out of the Pitan town? and they might get in trouble. Or maybe it, he didn't really matter much to the Jesuits among themselves. It was, it was not significant to be mentioned in this report. So, it was, so he was not mentioned at all. Maybe, no, we don't know. The important part here is that uh, Rizal and the, and the captain were very close. He even made a bus. This is in the Pitan Museum now, no? So Rizal made this of of the political military commander, a uh, commander, no? uh, Ricardo Carcinero. And, uh, and again, we can discuss that, why Rizal was not mentioned. But what is clear, Rizal did not instigate the trip. It was not his research design. It was not his uh, itinerary, his agenda. He was just there for the ride. And then he did some sketches, right? And the interesting part there is, why did he leave his notebook to Father Sanchez? Um, well, that's another question to be asked, no? Now, just to, to clarify the chronology, uh, remember, uh, Rizal had a strong sense of his uh, articulation of his geography. So the Circular Hispano-Filipino, as early as 1884, they were already thinking, okay, we have to write a history from the standpoint of the, uh, of the Filipinos, and then his International Association of Philippine Studies, 1889, right? Then he went back to Manila, June 7, immediately he went to Central Luzon, uh, invited people to join the meeting on July 3 of the La Liga Filipina. Now, La Liga Filipina, which is an, again, a new organization uh, that will campaign for independence. Soon after, he was arrested, and then he was deported, uh, uh, put a boat, military boat, by July 17, he was in uh, the Pitan. And by July 17, Father Sanchez was already in the Pitan too, no? uh, around that era. And December 15, he visited Lumanao Hill. So chronologically, it makes sense no? in terms of uh, sequence of, and it also makes sense that Father Sanchez was in the lead because of his stature, his experience, his interests, everything points to the fact that they went there, he first went there, and then he came back with Rizal and company to further excavate, right? Uh, there was an account here. Did you read that? Uh, the, uh, where is it again? Um, no, maybe later on. Uh, he said that uh, at the end, the... Uh, the report that they, they made, that his, his, his trip to, to the hills, they never found a cave, 
and they never found the treasure of uh, Maria Urai, right? And they never found the golden loom, no, because these are the folklores, no? So, but they found some artifacts. Ah, yeah, it's here. Okay. So, for, only Jello here knows this well, because Jello lives somewhere here. No? Uh, so, the, this is the Pitan, the Pitan town. Uh, and what, what is important is that uh, this is the area no, where uh, the, uh, the excursion happened. This is another map, and these are the three hills, L Limanan, L uh, Luminao, and Tupang, no, I think. But here, I hope it comes out well. So, Limanon, uh, Lumanao, and tu, Tupukan, Atapukan. No? And according to Sanchez, they're not limestone, they're conglomerates. Huh? Conglomerates, uh, and in, this, in that trip, they found a rockfall cave with human remains here, right? That was not uh, in any of Craig or uh, Bantong's uh, narrative. But they first came here in the morning, and then in the afternoon, they said, oh, it's going to get dark. Oh, what's that hill? They went to this hill, right? Collected shell samples, right? And then on the way back, they passed by Tapukan. And they said, oh, we, we need more equipment and people. The next time around, they did a beeline and went back to Limanon and Lumanao, that's all. And then they went back, right? So that's, this is where Rizal, and that's why in the drawing of Rizal, he, he was drawing it from the perspective of Limanon looking at Lumanao Hill. That's the sketch that was shown by Austin Craig no, in print, 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 published. So they excavated at the side of, near the top of the hill and found, and then on the top of the hill, collected fossilized tridacna shells and another species. Huh? And he said, okay, this goes to the Ateneo. Every time Father Sancho say, it goes to the Ateneo, no, we'll bring it. That, that monkey that they shot goes to Ateneo. <laughs> Everything goes to the Ateneo Museum. But you know what he didn't mention in the report? He didn't mention what happened to the ring and the pendant. That was not in his, fi in his final. So maybe he kept it. Maybe he kept it as a token. So he wrote in his, and this is the, the, the summary of the IR. said, Sancho said, despite going very well supplied with crowbars and pickaxes and a regular number of men who work hard at various points, we did not find the fabulous treasures of Maria Urai, nor the coveted cave uh, or the gold loom, right? The results of what was found in the excavation is as follows. And he tried to describe them. And they're trade war ceramics, shirts of different types of trade, trade, trade war ceramics, and uh, uh, Chinese dishes, uh, a piece of Japanese porcelain called celadon. Remember, he clearly, Sanchez was not a antiquary of this type. No? He was just trying to describe as, as best as he can. Uh, a sh in a shallow cave located at the foothills of the volcanic cone, which is Tapukan, we found fragments of the human skull, of the tibia, femur, radius, etc. A little piece of calcodini or carnelian agate of a vivid and raised red, blah, 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 blah sir. Uh, and then, here's the important thing. He did, an he did an interpretation. He did an interpretation. What does it all mean? So he said, all this seems to indicate that the ancient Subanons buried their disease on said hill or close since it is customary among them to bury all their clothes and objects with the dead, breaking the clay and porcelain once so that no one tries to use them. And this is uh, 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 Superior, the brief review. So he said, ah, these are Subanons. There was no doubt in his mind that the objects, the, the artifacts that were excavated are connected to Subanons because you see, they were interested in converting the Subanons. That's why they were also going there. They were trying to study the Subanans, just like Rizal. But Obak and, and Sanchez were there before Rizal, already interested in doing that, with the intention of, of proselytizing, of course. No? So, and then he said, oh, this report is bigger. I'll promise to send you the report on the fauna, flora, and mineralogy next time. That was how thorough Sanchez was. So between Rizal and Sanchez, Really, I am now very much convinced Rizal was 
in this sense, again, accidental. He just joined the second trip to the, and then did a bit of sketches, wrote about it, maybe sent a couple of stuff to Europe, which ended up in the Berlin Ethnographic Museum, right? Which uh, Bong Di Son uh, saw uh, back in the early not years uh, when they, uh, uh, well created. No? They're archaeological, uh, they're trade were ceramics, not ethnographic. So uh, I think it's, the trip was December. Uh, Sanchez was the leader. Sanchez did not include the pendant and the, <coughs> and the ring in, in the report uh, that being surrendered to Dateneo. Uh, who knows, right? Was Rizal really a friend of this old Jesuit, of the Jesuits? Who knows? Uh, a lot of accounts that they, are, they were good friends, but maybe not really that dear friends. No? And, uh, and I think Rizal was really, to summarize, an accidental archaeologist because, A, we know that he was out there, he was out in the field. We know that from the accounts of, in a roundabout way, of Craig, Gute, now Gute's Berlin, the Berlin collection, Gute already knew about it and already cited it. Uh, he was part of a directed excavation, the second trip. The first trip was accidental for Sanchez, perhaps. But the second trip, they went back intentionally to dig more. So they dug more in the same area in the, uh, near the top of uh, Limanon. No? And then he knew archaeology existed as a discipline. And he knew it was changing, but he never managed to apply the methodologies of archaeology when confronted out in the field. So he was not aware of it, or he was not conscious of how to, he didn't know how to do it. Uh, he was studying and not collecting. So he was studying, he was collecting stuff, he was shipping it out, he was not there to have a personal collection. And that makes him, again, more of the, of the contemporary archaeology type and not an antiquarian. But he, uh, again, like I said, but he did not use, there's no evidence of him using contemporary archaeological methods. Although that account that I could not find again, I, I, I explicitly remember that he mentioned that he, they made a deliberate square. So that's like control excavation, that's like a deliberate square. But for the life of me, I could not find that document again. Okay. So at the end, Brizal was an accidental archaeologist, a pioneer, nevertheless still. He was not the, the lead in this excavation in the Pitan, but that doesn't mean that, um, that uh, he was not ahead of his, uh, his contemporaries. No? If we compare him, let's say, to Isabella de los Reyes, to Paterno, all of them were cajoling others to uh, go uh, investigate, investigate the caves, or collect the data, etc. But they never actually went out in the field and do the actual collecting or, or recording of artifacts in situ. At least Rizal did that. So that it was edge over the others. All right. Thank you very much. And <laughs> question. All right. So now we're going to open up the floor to questions. And then also, yeah, just for a sort of quick little thing. Uh, we'll be using this mic so that the recording can hear the questions as well, so I'll be passing that around. Give it to Mandy, Mandy, sir. Uh, Vic, no, nice uh, talk. No? I have an issue on the use of accidental archaeology because using it in two forms. First, as a periodization of the development of the discipline mm -hmm. and referring to a person. No? So I think uh, there's a this chapter. Yeah. Uh, is accidental archaeology only tied to that period? Or an accidental archaeologist can be any time in that period. Yeah. No? Yes. And what differentiates an accidental archaeologist, the person, to an amateur archaeologist? Yes. Would you consider a result uh, as an amateur archaeologist also? No. Not just an accidental uh, or incidental archaeologist? That's a good point. Yes, that's part of the problem, man. Uh, that's why at the beginning I knew uh, that was part of the confusion. Uh, and I try to, to underscore no, that there are two levels. Now, the periodization, of course, that's only there, no? because after that, it has transformed to something else. But as an individual, uh, you know, that's good. Is an amateur archaeologist an accidental army? I, I think not. An amateur archaeologist 
is now applying a certain amount of deliberateness in whatever their knowledge of the current methodology. You know? The accidental one is someone who, like in this case, no? he was not there to, he was just there for the ride. No? He was there to do natural history, whatever's there, no? just going. And then they did archaeology on the side. No? And that was not his agenda. Oh, but he was already there, so he joined in. You know? But he was not in the lead. No? So in that way, he's accidental. So the short answer is an amateur archaeologist is not anymore an accidental archaeologist no? in that sense. Pede, pede. But his life was short. Eh? After this, he was killed. No? So, uh, <laughs> so. But the other thing I was trying to establish that if you look at his intellectual history, he was not really conscious about, he knew about archaeology, but he was not interested. Now, this is the fascinating, maybe Bowman can, can uh, say something about If you look at the intellectuals of that time, they knew, uh, you know, the past is important. They knew they have to make a history. They knew, but then they were trapped. Now, what's the approach? Oh, we don't have documents. Oh, we find as many documents we can. Oh, then we go to oral tradition. And then the most creative one was not only oral tradition, let's go to folklore. And so they put a lot of effort in folklore. No? So they were trapped there. But in front, of, under their noses, was an entire wealth of possibility of using, if they only knew about the methods of that time. No? If they only had drunk with a lot of archaeologists in, in Germany or Paris, they would have known that they could use those assemblages to argue their case. No? But they did. No? They, they were trapped in this. And it, it was like already there, no? but not there no? in their consciousness. I, I, that's, what I, that's my impression of my readings of all their. Yes, Dr. Uh, <coughs> Sige lang. Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, yung dagdag ko lang ay, dun sa ideological level, I think uh, there was something interesting happening. Uh, siguro, pwede natin matawag na pop archaeology. Mm -hmm. no? Tulad ng nalalaman natin ngayon. Mm -hmm. I think they were uh, well aware what we might, of what we might call pop archaeology. And there was some kind of, I think, uh, uh, parang they were thinking that archaeology was almost synonymous with Egyptology yes. at the time. Yeah. And if you look at yung iba pang mga sulatin ni Rizal, look at, for example, at filibusterismo. There's a lot about, you know, Simon and his treasure. Yes. Uh, yung uh, to, uh, earrings of Cleopatra, yeah. uh, mga uh, artifacts from Carthage. Uh, you'd have, uh, you know, rings from Hannibal's yeah. expeditions. And I mean, yeah. and then you'd have the Sphinx thing over there. All these references to... Uh, and then I mean, uh, uh, references to Champollion. Yeah. Also efforts to write uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, what do you call this? The uh, writing of uh, Egypt, what do you call this? Uh, hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics, yeah. right? Also you attempted to write that. I think there was some kind of idea sa mga ano, ilustrado that you know Egyptology was basically the same uh -huh. as what you know the archaeology was about mm. uh, from a pop perspective mm. and ideologically halimbawa si uh, Andres Bonifacio one of his favorite works was Las Ruinas de Palmira mm. by Comte de Volney and that was actually a uh, kind of uh, travel account of Syria and Egypt mm. na yan na ni because from an ideological perspective their idea was even great civilizations can be swallowed up by the sand, yes. can, can vanish, so that it's the same as a European civilization. Yeah. It will one day yeah. fade Vanier, yeah. and be forgotten, yeah. like the, ru the, the ruins yeah. of Egypt. So uh, I think uh, uh, archaeology also had some kind of uh, mm. connection with what they were trying to mm. recover, trying to reconstruct in terms of historical sense. Pero yun nga, it's kung really kung a, kung there's a lot of pop psychology that, to a, yeah. that cyclical rise and fall kind of thing, no? right? Right? That, that's the ideological yeah. uh, underpinning too. No? That's, there's this rising and falling, the uh, rising and falling of civilizations. Uh, of course, Toynbee articulated the best, but, but it's very old. No? And I think in the 19th century, that was yeah, what you're saying. No? And then, oh, I like that, yeah. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Oh, by the way, uh, the, the only people who have excavated in, in the Pitan here is Mandy and Lee. But you excavated the Ilian, no? the main, the, uh, the Ilian. No? So that's in the middle of town. No? Oh, no, no. 
So this is further south, no? further south. So we so we're surrounded by mangroves during Rizal's result time. And if you look at if you look at the map, right, the uh, you can see still see that it's really a, a very swampy, a mount, man, you know, mangrovey area. Yeah. Pede. Yeah. Lima, no? yeah. Correct, correct, yeah. Oh, and I forgot. <laughs> the Kota. So Bantung kept on saying, I went there in 1916, right? And I went to, he made a mistake. He didn't know it's Lima now, Lumanao, right? And he said he saw the cave. And he said, he saw the cave and he saw the wall, you know, depending the, so, and it was pre-Spanish. So I said, so I was intrigued by that. But looking at all the, all the writings again, and then again, Sanchez, the, and Bantu was not wrong. It was not just written clearly. The, the fortification is at the bottom of the hill. And it is submerged, when, when they were there, Sanchez and Arizal, it was already submerged underneath the, the river. The river moved, this, this creek here. So the quota was already underwater. No? In fact, that's where they were anchoring their banka, their boat, no? when, they were, when they were trying to explore uh, Limanon. No? So that was, they, they claim, Sanchez thinks, we don't know, that that was built by Maria Uray. No? So the early Christianized population. So there was no claim of pre-Spanish. No? So it's either here or it's there, no, but most likely it's here, no, no, in uh, the bottom of the, of the hill. Exciting, no? no? So that's, you see Jello, that's just Jello's backyard. Uh, where's Jello? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, uh, probably. Uh, yung mga recover po ba ni Rizal, ni Sanchez, or ni Obak, as naka-display ba siya dun sa museo ni Jose Rizal? Sa... Okay. Because most of them went to Ateneo, and Ateneo was totally destroyed. No? Okay. By, by, by fire, by the war. No? Uh, may, we don't know. But my, 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 the mystery is there. Did Father Sanchez keep the, uh, the ring and the pendant? No? Uh, I don't know. No. He died later. I mean, he was still around. And then, mind you, you know, there's another thing that's uh, amusing here. If I, you look at all the dead white people I've been showing you, they're all old, no? But don't forget that by the time they had their pictures taken, they were old. When they were out in the field, they were young. <laughs> it's just like looking at Mandy and myself, no? How the hell can you go to the field, right? But one time we were young, except that pictures were later on. <laughs> so he was not that old at that time. <laughs> yes, Paul. Fascinating subject, sir. So Rizal was surrounded by naturalists. Yes. Was there any chance that they talked about the Agusan Marsh find, the very first Stegodon find in the Philippines? Sanchez was very much interested in that. He was looking for fossils. In fact, he was so conscious about it that he always writes all the Jesuit uh, uh, parish priests. If you find anything, let then he investigates. Yes, I think so. In fact, you know, you can you can uh, go through the cartas. In fact, um, if you go, uh, Arcila reprinted it, uh, uh, Jesuit letters, 10 volumes. In the Jesuit letters, you might, you might look for the reports of Sanchez because he will mention there if he, he was aware of it. But uh, he was in, into that. He, he was just like you, you know, into, uh, into fossils. Any other questions or comments at this time? Because I do believe we are coming up on time. So I think we'll <coughs> cut today's Binala talk here. So, uh, 
So again, thank you, Servic, for presenting on this really interesting topic. Thank I'm you. Sure that, and I'm sure that if we, if we have any other questions that come up at a later date, he'll be more than happy to uh, entertain those questions. I like to have a picture like that. How can we do that? You know, the bang ganda picture, pensive lab. All right, so before we leave for today, uh, just one final announcement, and that is the Binal talk of next week of Helen Lewis. Ah. Right. Is Helen here? Ah, na saan na? Is she Helen competitive yan? Uh, yeah, so the, the title of that talk will be announced shortly. Uh, so pay attention to that uh, wherever you get your news on Binal talk. But otherwise, thank you for coming today. All right.